Welcome and thank you for joining me today. I greet you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to start this sermon by reading from Psalm 121, the psalm reaching out to God. I look up to the mountains. Does my strength come from mountains? No, my strength comes from God, who made heaven and earth and mountains. He won't let you stumble. Your guardian God won't fall asleep. Not on your life, Israel's guardian will never doze or sleep. God's your guardian, right at your side to protect you, shielding you from sunstroke, sheltering you from moonstroke. God guards you from every evil. He guards you very life. He guards you when you leave and when you return. He guards you now. He guards you always. Let's praise the Lord together. Such small sacrifice If not joined with my life I sing in vain tonight May the words I say And the things I do May my life song sing Bring a smile to you Let my life song sing to you. Let my life song sing to you. I want to sign your name to the end of this day. Know that my heart was true. Let my life song sing. Sacrifice to reach a world in need to be your hands and feet. So, with the words I say and the things I do, make my life so sing, bring a smile to you. Let my life song sing to you. Let my life song sing to you. I want to sign your name to the end of this day. Know that my heart was true. Let my life song sing. song sing to you Let my life 
Lord, thank you for this time you've given us to open your word and to discover who you are. Thank you that you don't leave us in the dark about who you are and what you are doing in the world, but that you have revealed yourself and your world through the Bible, your sacred words to us. Lord, we need wisdom as we read your word. You promise us in James that we only have to ask for wisdom to receive it. Lord, please give us your wisdom now as we approach your word. Help us discern the truth of the text. Help us not to rely on our own understanding. Thank you, God, for the clarity, encouragement and hope your word brings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today we're going to read from Chronicles 32, verses 1 to 22. After all that Ezekiel has so faithfully done, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. When Ezekiel saw that, that Sennacherib had come and that he intended to wage war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city. And they helped him. They gathered a large group of people who blocked all the springs and the streams that flowed through the land. Why should the king of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. Then he worked hard repairing all the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it. He built another wall outside that won and reinforced the terraces of the city of David. He also made large numbers of weapons and shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gate and encouraged them with these words, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, for there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Ezekiel, the king of Judah, said. Later, when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and all his forces were laying siege to Lachish, he sent his officers to Jerusalem with this message for Ezekiel, king of Judah, and for all the people of Judah, who were there. This is what Sennacherib, king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing your confidence that you remain in Jerusalem under siege? When Ezekiel says, The Lord our God will save us from the hand of the king of Assyria. He is misleading you to let you die of hunger and thirst. Did not Ezekiel himself remove this God's high places and altars, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, You must worship before one altar and burn sacrifices on it? Do you not know what I and my predecessors have done to all the peoples of the other lands? Were the gods of those nations ever able to deliver their land from my hand? Who of all the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed has been able to save his people from me? How then can your God deliver you from my hand? Now do not let Hezekiah deceive you and mislead you like this. 
Do not believe him, for no God of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or the hand of my predecessors. How much less will your God deliver you from my hand? Sennacherib's office spoke further against the Lord God and against his servant Ezekiel. The king also wrote letters ridiculing the Lord, the God of Israel, and saying this against him. Just as the gods of the people of the other lands did not rescue their people from my hand, so the God of Ezekiel will not rescue his people from my hand. Then they called out in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to terrify them and make them afraid in order to capture the city. They spoke about the God of Jerusalem as they did about the God of the other peoples of the world, the work of human hands. King Ezekiel and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. And the Lord sent an angel who inhaled all the fighting men and the commanders and officers in the camp of Assyria king. So he was drawn to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with the sword. So the Lord saved Ezekiel and the people of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others. He took care of them on every side. Many brought offerings to Jerusalem for the Lord and valuable gifts for Ezekiel, king of Judah, from then on, he was highly regarded by all the nations. Finding God in Desperate Places I'd like to write a book someday called Desperate Places, How God Shines Through Our Weakness. These desperate places are places of weakness, brokenness and vulnerability. They compromise the times in our lives when we're at wit's end. And if God doesn't show up with power and redemption, we're lost. The Apostle Paul described a desperate place in his life in 2 Corinthians 12. I will boost about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me, he wrote. Desperate places are agonizing places. But there are also the places where God unleashes his power, in which we could never imagine. Second Chronicles 32 describes a desperate place. This is a story about finding God's strength in the midst of our weakness, brokenness and vulnerability. For nearly 30 years, the nation of Assyria was the reigning superpower. They were big, strong, organized, efficient, and incredibly cruel. In 701 BC, Sennacherib, the Syrian king, started moving in vast army down the coast of Palestine to recapture all the territories that were supposed to remain under Assyria's thumb. He eventually made his way to the hill country of Judah to topple the fortified city of Lachish, to bring us to 2 Chronicles 32 verse 1, there are a few things to understand about this context behind this story. First, the Assyrians weren't like the other superpowers. They su surpassed everyone in the sheer cruelty and savagery. As they conquered new places, they took the leaders and hung their bodies on poles. Archaeological digs have uncovered artwork from the time that shows Sennacherib lounging on his throne, being fed grapes by one of his wives and holding a wine goblet in his hand, while off in the distance, in a grove of trees, Assyria's enemies are hanging upside down and headless. Not only were the Assyrian armies violent, but they were also masters of psychological warfare. They utilized intimidation techniques brilliantly. They were masters of fear. The Assyrian invasion would have created a spiritual crisis. Why would God allow this powerful, cruel and violent army 
to attack his people. Why didn't he stop it? Where is God in the midst of this trouble and fear and destruction? This is a real crisis. How will Israel's leaders respond? Desperate places require action. The first element in human action initiative, plain hard work. In 2 Chronicles 32, we read that the first thing Hezekiah did was to consult with others. This is so practical and helpful when you're going through trouble. Whom do you lean on? Are you in trouble? Are you facing things that make you feel afraid and overwhelmed? Ask for help. Don't go it alone. Consult with others as soon as possible. After consulting the officials, cut off the town's water supply. The Assyrians came with battering rams to demolish the walls around the city. And Judah's troops kept lightning the battering rams of fire. Assyria needed water to extinguish the flames, but the water supplies were all blocked. Notice in this account how having faith does not preclude taking action. Martin Luther once commented, Oh, it's a living, creative, active, mighty thing, this faith. It's a living, creative, active, mighty thing, this faith. Some people get the impression that having faith means the end of human inquinity and initiative. Not at all. We work because we have faith. We work in our faith. We let our faith spur us on to good deeds. Faith sometimes implies fighting well for the right things in the right way. We know from archaeological digs of the battle described in this story, for example, that Ezekiel and his armies fought back. One of the most surprising discoveries at Lachish was a massive counter ram built by Judah's army opposite the Assyrian siege ramp. These guys didn't just trust God and then roll over and play dead. They had something valuable the lives of women and children, and a way of life and faith that was worth protecting. Their faith led to action. We've been involved with a missionary in Mozambique for the last maybe 15 years. We work with Geraldo Erasmus of Mosaic Upliftment Trust. They do things. They don't just think about things or forever plan things or even just pray about things. They share the good news of Jesus in their words and in very practical ways, teaching new horticultural ways for the people of Mozambique. Geraldo headed several construction projects to create facilities in three communities from where training can be provided. Geraldo and his team educate and train trainers from rural communities. Mosaic is involved with 25 plus churches plant, church plants in different communities and from the seven districts. These leaders and others will be trained from Manjakas to go back to the communities to bring change, growth and a better future. Our faith should be active. Sometimes we think, I know that I'm forgiven and that my God is a loving God of grace. Great. But what are you doing about that today? How will that change how you spend your money? What you watch on TV? How you spend your free time and what you do to serve your local church? Faith is earthly and practical. Desperate places require radical trust. This isn't just a story about human inquinity and initiative. More than anything, it's a story of God's supernatural presence and power in our desperate places. One of the central themes of the Christian story is what the theologians call the fall of mankind. Although we have been and still are glorious creatures made in the image of God, we're also deeply flawed human beings with a warp towards sin. 
every human being on this planet is flawed in every part of this of his or her life. Total depravity doesn't mean that every part of me is as bad as it could be. It doesn't mean that there isn't glory and goodness in my heart. It just means that all our attitudes, actions and even our deepest and most spiritual thoughts and aspirations are bent and flawed. The Academy Award winning movie Crash contains a powerful scene that illustrates total depravity. Throughout the movie, a white rookie cop consistently fights against the blatant racism in his police department. He is young and idealistic and he wants to conquer the evil of hatred and prejudice. He utterly convinced that his innocent heart will prevail. Toward the end of the movie, while he's off duty, he picks up a young black hitchhiker. The black kid reaches his hand into his pocket to pull out a small figurine for the dashboard. But the white cop assumes he's reaching for a gun, so he shoots and kills his passenger. In utter horror and panic, the cop drives the car to an abandoned lot and sets it ablaze with the black youth still inside. As the flames ascended from the car, we watch the once idealistic cop walking away, signed by his own depravity and daydreams. He's joined the ranks of broken men with broken hearts. The Bible puts it this way, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We are warped away from God. Pastors can do church work with a warped and fallen heart. Even mothers can love their children with a warped heart. Even doctors can remove an appendix with a heart warped by pride or callousness. The good news is that this is where faith comes in. We have to come to the place where we feel and confess our brokenness and fallenness even in the midst of our noble and spiritual activity. We must realize where our strength and activity end and where the power and activity of God begin. We are the fractured clay vessels and Jesus is the mighty, glorious treasure within those clay pots. Faith begins when we acknowledge who we are. We are active, creative, broken and weak. But more importantly, we are people filled with the glorious treasure of Jesus Christ. In verses 6 to 8, Ezekiel encourages the people by pointing them toward God. In fact, there are four com commands in verse 7. Be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Then he gives the reason for the commands. For there is a greater power with us than with him. Ezekiel's confidence is not in his strength, but in the significance of God's supremacy in every situation of life. Verse 8 explains, The people gain confidence from what Ezekiel said. Shortly after Ezekiel spoke these words of encouragement, the people were shocked with more psychology warfare. Verse 18 reveals the purpose of spiritual warfare. To terrify you and make you afraid, Satan wants you to live in fear and terror. God wants you to live with courage. God wants his people to encourage one another in their desperate places. In verse 19, the Assyrians dealt away the final insult by comparing the God of Israel with the idols of the nations the work of men's hands. That God's immediate answer is to send an angel. His account compresses time in such a way as to suggest that Nacharib was assassinated immediately upon, immediately upon his return to Nineveh. Actually, Nacharib was murdered by his son, Adrimelech, which worshipping in the temple some 20 years later. From God's perspective, this prayer was answered immediately. But from the human perspective, 20 years passed before the prayer was answered. In other words, prayer from desperate places, places means waiting on the Lord. 
Leonard Cohen wrote the following, Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Paul says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. May we never forget in desperate times that our strengths come from God who lives in me and you. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you that I am your child and you are my Father and Sovereign Lord. May my heart rejoice in good times and in bad. And may your abiding joy and perfect peace find residence in my heart as I rest in your love and trust in your unfailing goodness. In Jesus' name, Amen. There's now opportunity to give thanks to our God through our offering. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. <laughs>